Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Off Demystified podcast. We're today joined by Dan Grossberg, who is currently running sales operations or is the director of sales operations at Seven Rooms. And according to Dan's LinkedIn profile, he makes and breaks things. Dan, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Tom. Um, so first thing, I really like your if, if, if anyone's listening to this, go to LinkedIn and then type in Dan Grossberg and then go to Dan's uh, LinkedIn profile. The tagline where most people normally have like influencer, head of sales, et cetera. Dan just has like make and break things. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about that, Dan, and how you think that is what sales operations does if you do? <laughs> yeah. So um, I think by putting that out there, it shows a little bit more about my personality um, so like, I do like to have a lot of fun with the, the work that I sort of do. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly think that aligns with what I do and le- at least how I approach sales operations. Um, so, uh, I mean, at, at a high level, sales operations is there to solve some problems, right? And sometimes you're going to need to break down current processes or break down walls between uh, different departments so that they communicate better and then build up by enabling teams, uh, giving them new processes, new technologies to, to use. Um, so I thought that was a pretty short, uh, fun way to, to narrow that down. Sure. And um, I think you've had about nine years in the sales ops game. So can you, I think you shifted in from being a business analyst, right? So can you explain how and why you did that? Sure. Yeah. So I, I kind of fell into the sales operations team sort of by accident, I suppose. Like I started in sales and then moved to that business analyst role um, and really uh, honed in on this natural curiosity that I had, like just trying to figure out how things work. Um, so being a business analyst was great there because I was playing with lots of data um, and uh, I was running a lot of reports and uh, doing a little bit of project management. Uh, but then when I got introduced to the world of Salesforce administration, that like really opened up my eyes and that helped me understand a lot more about how businesses operated um, and, uh, you know, what makes things move. So it's kind of like a natural progression to move from business analysts to sales operations. Um, and I was fortunate enough where a manager at the time who was the sales ops manager left the company. So there was that opportunity presented to me. So I, you know, stepped up to the plate and, and jumped in that role and, that's kind of where I've been since. Got it. And, and I assume you have no plans to leave the sales ops world. I mean, I love it. There's, uh, there's certain days where I'm like, hmm, maybe I could do something else like, uh, I don't know, pottery or uh, you know, do some uh, woodworking. But I know I really do enjoy uh, being able to peel back the current a bit and, and help uh, you know, companies move. So um, I really do enjoy operations. I'm going to check back in with you in 12 months, Dan. And if you're not doing pottery, I'm going to be really disappointed. Um, no. um, zooming into today, uh, seven rooms, how many reps are you currently responsible for and how many people in the sales ops team? Sure. So we have three folks in the sales ops team, including myself. Um, and there are 35 sellers. Actually, no, we just jumped up. So there's about 40 sellers right now and we have 12 SDRs. Got it. And so a recent jump in the number of reps. Can you tell us about the onboarding process? Um, anything that you've learned recently that could be valuable to the listeners? Sure. So the onboarding process uh, is pretty interesting for the sales reps. Um, everybody at Seven Rooms has about a two-week onboarding process. And the first week is pretty much the same regardless of the role that you have. And that's learning about the company itself, learning about the culture, the reason that we exist and who we're trying uh, to help and what we're trying to sell for. Uh, But for the sales onboarding for week two, there's a ton of shadowing that goes on, not just uh, from sales folks themselves, but they're also shadowing other areas of the business. So they're listening in on customer success calls, uh, customer support as well, and sitting in with marketing meetings uh, to get like a real rounded approach and and understanding of the the pains that we're trying to solve for. And I think that's extremely helpful in, um, in getting folks to sell because, you know, essentially what you're trying to do is solve problems. And, and I think that uh, gets the speed much quicker seeing all different areas of our customers. I totally agree with that point. Um, and I think so many reps or businesses will benefit by having their sales reps before they kick off, like reaching out, to actually understand more about the business as opposed to just being like chucked in, learning the product in onboarding and then trying to sell. So I think that's a massive, massive point. Um, 
anything on rep productivity or actually from the last nine years, can you remember like a single thing or new process that you implemented that had a massive impact on how much time reps could spend selling? Yeah. So the past few companies where I've seen a lot of time being um, eaten up, it has been around the whole contracting process. So like CPQ, for example, um, and uh, especially my, my past two roles, I have been able to come in and, and streamline that um, tremendously. So not only saving reps times and generating up their contracts and sending them out for signature, and then all the administrative work that needs to happen after that, um, been able to utilize essentially the Salesforce platform to build this out without needing to buy any uh, ridiculously expensive tools. Um, you know, relieving the pain of having to copy and paste things into your Word document templates and sending them out. Um, those have been like some of the lowest hanging fruit and the easiest gifts that have the biggest impact that I've noticed. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, those are sort of the things that like when I roll them out and and you get like the smiles like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier to do. You have no idea. And um, I mean, actually, I do have an idea. Like I've lived that world a little bit, so I know how painful it could be. Um, but those are some of my, my favorite ones to roll out, you know, super quick, especially when I join an org. Actually, on that point, quickly, uh, the, the sales tech stack you guys are running. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Salesforce is our, is our CRM. And uh, we layer on top of that groove for our account executives. Our SDRs are using outreach. Um, but all across the sales org, we're using Gong, we're using Troops. And uh, for sales ops, we're using a tool called Sonar. What does Sonar do? Sure. Sonar connects to the metadata of Salesforce, so you could easily see where when fields are added or fields are changed. But more importantly, when you go into the CRM to make changes like remove a field, you're able to see which workflow rules or where that, uh, which automated pieces that touches. Um, and it really helps you know, save a lot of pain if you accidentally remove a pick list value. You can see where it was referenced elsewhere in, in your setup. Um, so that's certainly saved us a lot of headaches. Got it. Um, and then back to this uh, automated contracting process without any expensing, expensive tools. So you're running that whole thing within Salesforce uh, using no other external software? Yeah, so there are some tools that sit on top of it, um, but like our contract generating piece, uh, we've used uh, things like Conga Composer or Draw Loop, uh, Nintex Draw Loop in the past to generate the documents themselves. And of course, your e signature tool. So um, you know, your DocuSigns or the Panda Docs or what have you, those certainly sit within there, but being able to merge in fields from your Salesforce data um, and then setting that out for e signature has been huge. Um, but yeah, utilizing that, us utilizing the visual flow, or I believe they call it um, lightning flow now, uh, to have like guided step-by-step uh, -step screens has uh, really helped folks increase their productivity. Got it. So previously, would a rep be like, Oh, I need to send a contract. They'd like get Word ready and they start typing stuff out from Salesforce and then they'd like format to a PDF and then email it. Is that what would happen? Yes, that's exactly it. Cool. And, and then if you didn't have like the most recent Word template uh, downloaded and you're sending old language or like a contract with the wrong address on it, that could be pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. And so now the reps are simply pressing a few buttons in Salesforce. That's right. Yep. Nice. <laughs> okay. Awesome. And next, I want to move on to, well, let's see if the forecasting process is as streamlined. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so where I'm at right now, it's really not all that built out. And that's uh, one of the things that I've been focusing on um, adjusting. So I'm relatively new to Seven Room. So um, really need to increase our adoption of some of the systems that we have here. And part of that is our Salesforce opportunity process. Um, so our forecasting isn't great right now. We're doing a lot of stuff outside of the system using spreadsheets, um, but I'm working with some of the different sales leaders to, uh, to change that a bit. And um, yeah, we're going to move to a, a more biweekly cadence to uh, do our pipeline and forecasting reviews uh, once we have all of our data in our systems. Got it. Okay. So there's going to be a biweekly meeting or just a biweekly forecasting yeah, so it, it's going to be uh, kind of two different setups. So like the second week of the month, we're going to do our early forecast for the month um, and review the pipeline, like the later stage deals and see what is closing in. And then the last week of the month, hold like a new forecasting call for that month to see what movement has uh, taken place over the past two weeks um, and get like really good eyes on how we're going to end up with that month. Got it. So the first week is the reviewing 
current pipeline and the final week is more looking at new pipeline. That's right. Cool. And who's in those meetings? So it's uh, it's our sales leaders. And right now we're small enough where we have all of our sales leaders and our sales reps in there as well. Um, so yeah, that's the... Uh, oh, so you have, you have nearly around 60 people in the meeting? About that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's cozy, but um, it's not <laughs> that massive just yet. Yeah, I remember uh, for the episode we we stopped having the reps come to this meeting because <laughs> it, it wasn't there were too many people. It was just there was too many <laughs> too many voices. Um, not saying anything bad about salespeople, of course. <laughs> um, awesome. And then next up is interacting with the reps. Um, You've obviously, or I'm assuming you've developed a way of working with salespeople as you've been doing it for a while now. Um, any tips on how you can manage or influence reps to do something that uh, might not be directly related to their goals? Yeah, so I mean, that that whole getting them to do something that may directly help them is is a challenge. And like in prior life, I'd always take the WIFM approach, right? The what's in it for me. Um, but you can, you're not always going to have something like that. So early on in my career, like, uh, again, showing my personality, I, I try to interact with folks, and, like earn their trust. So early on, so that they know I truly am there to help them um, be as successful as they can. So after earning their trust uh, and working with them and like partnering with them on a lot of these different things, um, that's really helped out quite a bit. And like having empathy is a huge thing. So um, I know I could be very direct and very cold at times when I need certain things done. Um, and I always need to remind myself to be empathetic when asking folks to do things. Um, so I think that's a very helpful tip in, in when rolling out a new process or a new tool. Uh, but then like always getting a ton of feedback, never shutting the door, um, always listening and understanding what their pains are. It doesn't mean you're going to change things, but like, again, going back to that empathy, understanding what the pains are, um, and uh, really working with small groups to roll out uh, changes and have them sell it internally and have them be your champions for you. Um, it's almost like you're doing internal sales um, at that point. Well, I guess it, it literally is doing internal sales. Yeah, you're, you're selling. Um, cool. And then if you could only measure one sales-related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? For me, it would be a stage conversion. Um, and it's not just, uh, like your close rates or your win rates, but like the individual stages in your selling process. And I think by measuring that you could really identify different areas in, in the sales process where, um, either more coaching or like, it's, it's really telling. So like either you need to coach reps in different areas of their selling, or it could be things about like your market and your pricing is way off. Um, I think if I had to choose one, that would be it. Got it. And you came straight out with that. And normally I've surprised people with that one, but you, you must have listened to previous episodes and you know that I'm asking it like every time now. Um, <laughs> got it. And so the insights you can get, and so this might be like from stage two to stage three, you can see if a rep might not be performing, but also more macro trends, like maybe your pricing is too high because you're, the conversion rate from revealing the price pricing discussion to the next stage is too low. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, if there are things off in like, uh, you know, when you're reviewing your contracts or in later stage negotiations, uh, that could be a very different story that it's telling. Sure. Cool. And the final question, who has been the most influential person in your sales ops career? Hmm. So I have a few, if that's okay. Um, if you yeah, yeah, mind. hit me. <laughs> All right. So the, the first one who really started me on this track um, isn't it? necessarily a sales ops ninja per se, but like just, um, it was somebody who I worked alongside with, uh, we were cubicle mates, uh, way back in the day when I was early in my career. Um, and he was like a very organized kind of like geeky type of guy. Um, but like there were certain topics that would get him to open up, uh, like especially cars. Like I love BMWs. So it was great. Mm. Um, but the point is that, um, the way that he was, uh, so organized and so detailed that when he would lead these projects, he was, um, he was managing up quite a bit and like being in a sales operations role, like some of the things that I enjoy is that you touch many different levels in the org. So like I would just sit there and marvel at how he was able to talk to like an SVP um, of different departments that were like 18 levels above where we were, but like be able to get them engaged and, um, and be able to execute. Um, I thought that was really interesting. His name is Matt Chulik. Um, but two other folks that um, that I've really learned a lot from by 
really just watching and, and um, uh, engaging with their content. One is Doug Landis, who uh, works at a VC now, but he did enablement over at Box and Salesforce and Google. You might have heard of those uh, companies. And, um, and finally, uh, Marco Savic over at Funnelcake. Um, really enjoyed uh, the content that he's been putting out, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to have a few conversations with him and really likes how he approaches sales operations. Got it. So I've got Matt Chulik, Doug Landith, and Marco Savic. Yep. Got it. And Marco's at Funnel Cake. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah, I, I do agree with your point about sales ops, speaking with people from FDRs all the way to like head of sales, all the way to CEO. Um, totally agree. Dan, let me read out a couple of the things I thought were particularly um, in, impactful in this interview. The first, and I really like this, we haven't heard this before, but I urge people listening to tweak your onboarding process to allow sales to get a more holistic view of the business. I think that can have massive benefits down the road. And then I also liked your the metric, stage conversion, and it's actually a, a, a multiple metrics, right? But the fact that it can give you insights from where the rep is just performing all the way up to maybe your pricing. It's not working. So those are the two big things. Um, and I'm sure that they have added a massive value to the audience. So thank you so much, Dan, for your time. Tom, thank you so much. This has been awesome.